morning. Welcome to church this morning. We continue with a, another five-minute Bible study today. A programming announcement. This is our 10th five-minute Bible study on baptism. And so we're going to take a break for, from these for the month of December. And then uh, we'll evaluate and see what we do in January. If you've appreciated them, if you have enjoyed them, let us know about that. If you'd like to see us do something else, let us know about that as well. Uh, but one more today on baptism. A little bit of review we have today as well. We remember uh, from Matthew 28, Jesus tells us who should be baptized, make disciples of all nations. We remember that's not just people from all around the world, that's people of all ages. This is further supported in the Bible when we read stories about whole entire families being baptized at the same time. God's gift of baptism is for all nations and people of all ages. We also remember that sometimes people say, well, you can't be baptized till later because you've got to say something. You've got to do something. But what does the Bible say? The Bible in Titus 3 reminds us that we are saved not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to God's own mercy. By the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. So who's doing the work in baptism? It's not you. It's not me. It's God. And so that gift of baptism can be for someone of all ages, right? Whether you're two days or 92 plus years. We also remember that baptism is for everyone because baptism brings us the forgiveness of sins. And, well, who's a sinner? Everyone. The Bible would say we're a sinner from birth. In fact, it would go farther. It would say we're a sinner from the moment we're conceived. We've inherited that sin from our parents. And then once we're born, it doesn't take long for us to, to commit sins ourselves. And so do we need that forgiveness? Yes. And so we remember baptism is for, for all ages. But then we also, you might remember, uh, we talked about a few weeks ago, baptism's not a magic standalone thing, right? Right after Jesus calls us to baptize all nations, he says, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And so it's not just baptism, it's baptism and then a responsibility to teach the faith. And how does that teaching happen? Well, it happens through parents. It happens through grandparents. It happens through being able to come to church and to hear about what God has done. It also sometimes can come through a formal process that we in the church might call confirmation. And for us, uh, oftentimes we have that for our youth confirmands, maybe when they're in the sixth grade or the seventh grade. But it can happen at any time in our life as an adult, a time to learn about what we believe and teach and confess. Uh, from God's word and then at the end of that time to make a public confession of what God has done for you and so some may say well baptism and confirmation then they're two completely separate things right and actually the answer is no they're very much connected how so well this is how so. Do you remember what this is? A delivery confirmation slip? This is, I think, something of an older year. Because now you don't have to get this, right? It just comes automatically, or you get a text, or you get some notification that your package has been delivered. But back in the day, if my parents wanted to know that the package they sent was received, they had to pay extra and have one of these slips. And then they would get a postcard in the mail back from the person who signed it, who said, yes, I got what you sent to me. You know, when we have a confirmation, when we uh, confirm our faith after a period of instruction, this is really what we're doing. We're saying, God, in my baptism, whether that was long ago or whether it was a moment ago, I know what you gave to me. You gave me life and forgiveness. You made me your child. You made me a part of your family, and you gave me this promise that will endure now and forever. I got it. I received it, and it's not because of me. It's not because of anything I've done. It's all what you did for me in my baptism. And so that's why we have 
the process of confirmation uh, to be able to say, Lord, I got what you sent to me. So I know that I think almost all of us, if not all of us, have received God's wonderful gift of baptism. If not, or if there's someone you know who hasn't, let us know. We'd love to talk about that, to, to talk about God's gifts for you. What about confirmation? Maybe that's something that hasn't happened for you in your life. Perhaps you would like to make that public confession of what you believe after learning that. If so, let us know as well. We can uh, yet again point back to God's gifts in baptism and say through the power of the Holy Spirit, God, I got what you gave to me there. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for baptism. Thank you for saving us through Jesus and through the water and your word. Lord, thank you also for leading us to learn and grow in our faith so that we can make a public confession of what you have done for us and that we have received it by your grace. We pray this together in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we prepare for worship this morning, we listen together to our opening prayer. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to church on the first Sunday of Advent. It's always uh, a wonderful experience, isn't it, to come into our sanctuary on this day uh, when everything's decorated, when we see that something important is coming up, and surely it is. And so we prepare in this season of Advent to celebrate anew the birth of Jesus our Savior, but also... As New Testament Christians, we uh, remember and prepare our hearts for the day when Jesus will come again. We rest assured in his promise that he will. So many thanks to all who decorated for Donna Dixon, who leads the way, and for so many others who give their time and talents to decorate our, our sanctuary at this time of year. We thank God for you. Uh, other announcements today, as we are in the season of Advent, it means our midweek Advent services will begin this Wednesday. Uh, you've had uh, the times in your bulletin and on the screen the last couple weeks. Just a reminder, this year we're able to go back to have two uh, Wednesday services. So one of those will be at 11 a.m., immediately following our morning Bible class, and the other one will be at 5.30. So hopefully this provides an opportunity uh, to worship uh, where you can get home before dark if you want to come at 11 but also you can come to our midweek worships after work or other things during the week 
at 5.30. Uh, we look forward to seeing you there as we journey through the season of Advent, uh, looking at it through the lens of art. Uh, and we look forward to that first opportunity to do that on Wednesday. Today in Bible class, we're continuing on. Last week, we had our Ask Anything Sunday. We had some leftover questions from last week. We're going to get to those in Bible class this morning. So I invite you to come and be a part of that following our service today. And then a reminder, even though it's rainy outside, later today we're having a congregational skating party over at Lind Arena at 3.30. Uh, and so if you or your family, your children or grandchildren or friends, if you'd like to come and be a part of that, uh, please do so later on today. One last reminder, our special family Christmas event, that's coming up <clears throat> soon on Sunday, December 11th. That's for you and your family. And if you're a part of our church family at Trinity, it's for you as well. We'd love to know if you're coming, though, so we can prepare for the meal and our event together. There's sign-up sheets outside the church office, or you can sign up uh, through the insert uh, online through the code there as well. So with those announcements shared, let's speak together then our verse of the month for the month of November from Psalm 30. Sing praises to the Lord, O you his saints, and give thanks to his holy name. Psalm 30, verse 4. Let's begin with a word of opening prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, as we come together today, we thank you for every opportunity that you lead us together to hear your word to hear that we are forgiven by Jesus, our Savior. And especially in the season of Advent, Lord, to hear the promise that we aren't only preparing to celebrate Jesus' coming uh, in the past, but we're preparing to celebrate his coming anew when he comes again um, at the last day. Lord, prepare our hearts for that day. Keep us ever waiting in faith for Jesus to return. And thank you for the joyful uh, trip that we have ahead of us to the new Jerusalem when Jesus, our Savior, comes again. We pray this together in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, one word about our opening hymn today. It's an Advent hymn, the Advent of our King. We mentioned this on Wednesday in our Thanksgiving Eve service, but to mention it to you as well. If you're reading along in the hymnal, Perhaps on some verses, you notice that there's a little triangle before the last verse of a hymn. Maybe you've seen that before, and maybe you've asked yourself, what is that about? What does that mean? Well, usually if you see that, that denotes a Trinitarian verse, meaning the verse will be all about Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And a good tradition in the church has always been for those verses that the congregation would stand to sing them. Now, we haven't done that in the past because we haven't had hymnals, right, until up-to-date hymnals until just this summer, uh, but now we do. And so we're gonna try and, and start that tradition. When we get to a verse that has a Trinitarian verse and the triangle, we're gonna stand together as a congregation. Now, if you're reading in your hymnal, it will have that triangle if you're looking on the display, it will have a little up arrow. Um, so you can follow the triangle, you can follow the up arrow, or you can follow uh, the example of Vicar and I, as we'll stand for the, the verse that has that Trinitarian theme. And so we sing together the advent of our king, and then on verse 6, we'll stand on verse 6 when we sing that verse.
beginning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? Since we are gathered together to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise and receive his forgiveness. Let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I invite you to kneel for a moment of silent reflection and confession. Together as God's people, we say, Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, hear now God's words of mercy and grace that are spoken to you. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you of all of your sins. And so as a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you of all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Together we stand. And we continue by speaking responsively the words of our introit. Behold, your king is coming to you. Save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has made his light to shine upon us. You are my God, and I give thanks to you. You are my God, I will you. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation. In peace let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Stir up your power, O Lord, and come, that by your protection we may be rescued from the threatening perils of our sins and saved by your mighty deliverance. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated as we continue with our hymn of the month. Come, ye thankful people, come. The Old Testament reading for today, the first Sunday in Advent, is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. The word that Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains, and shall be lifted up above the hills and all the nations shall flow to it. And many peoples shall come and say, come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between nations and shall decide disputes for many peoples and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. O house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. 
This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our epistle reading is from the book of Romans, chapter 13, verses 8 through 14. Owe no one anything except to love each other, for the one who loves another fulfills the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is fulfilling of the law. Besides this, you know the time. That hour has come for you to wake from sleep, for salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone, the day is at hand. So then, let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and in jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 21st chapter. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put, them, uh, put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed after him were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest! And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up, saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Christ. You may be seated as we continue with our sermon hymn, Savior of the Nations Come.
Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. May God bless our time of meditation this day on his word for us from the psalm that's appointed for this day. That's Psalm 122 as we begin the season of Advent and seek to prepare our hearts to celebrate our Lord's first coming as we look toward, forward toward the day of Jesus' second coming as well. Since we didn't hear this psalm in our service today, if you'd like to follow along in your pew Bible, you can. I encourage you to do so at Psalm 122. That's on page 517. 517, Psalm 122. Back in the day when someone would plan a trip, they might call up AAA to request maps or guidebooks to be sent to their home. Or... Maybe you'd go over to a friend's house, someone who had been to where you wanted to go so that you could maybe watch a slideshow of all the sites that you might find there. Or if you didn't do any of those things, if you didn't know where you wanted to go or what you wanted to do, perhaps someone would just call up a travel agent and have it all planned out for them. Perhaps some of you are familiar with some of that. But of course, nowadays, things are quite different, aren't they? There is such a wealth of information available about just about any travel destination that you could ever hope to see simply by typing your destination into Google or using one of many travel apps. You can read so much online nowadays about places you might like to visit. In fact, you might know more than a local when you arrive, if you take advantage of all the stuff you could read. One staple of contemporary travel blogs nowadays are posts called trip reports. I love reading others' trip reports. Maybe, maybe you do too. What is a trip report? It's simply a chronicle of someone's recent trip to a certain destination. So as you read it, you'll hear about what they did and where they went and what they ate, as well as the things they enjoyed and the things they didn't. Some trip reports are so detailed and descriptive that I can almost envision myself being there and experiencing the trip just through the pictures or the words of the post. Well, the psalmist here in Psalm 122, he provides his own version of a trip report. A trip report centered around a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. The excitement and joy in the psalmist's voice almost leaps off the page as he writes this in verse 1. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. He rejoiced when he heard the great news that they would be making the trip to the house of Yahweh. And then, almost before they knew it, they were there. Perhaps you remember a time in your life when you felt a similar excitement. Maybe it was arriving at your grandparents' house to celebrate a holiday when you were growing up. Or perhaps it was the moment you stepped inside your favorite sports team stadium for the very first time. Or maybe it was when you finally arrived at a long-awaited bucket list vacation destination and laid your eyes on the place you had dreamed of seeing for so long. Perhaps at moments like these, you even felt a need to pinch yourself a little to be convinced that it was true, to be convinced that it was real. If you have experienced a moment or moments like that in your life, then you likely can relate a little to what the psalmist was experiencing too, for he had similar feelings about Jerusalem, and with good reason. In the Old Testament, Jerusalem served as a center of worship for God's chosen people, the Jews. It would become the home to the tabernacle, the very ark of the covenant where God's presence rested. And it was the place where the faithful would come from far and wide to gather together in worship too. There were so many people in this city, so many visitors, but they weren't merely tourists. 
No, the faithful people of Israel came to Jerusalem for a reason and for a purpose. As our psalm says, to give thanks to the name of the Lord. These Jewish pilgrims would religiously come to Jerusalem three times each year to give thanks and to worship God. So it's clear, it's clear that Jerusalem was an important place to be. And a trip there would have been awfully special. But, but, what does it all mean for us today? Do we need to start arranging our own travel plans to Jerusalem ourselves? Do we need to order guidebooks or fire up our travel apps? While a trip to the Holy Lands would be exciting, enjoyable, enriching, and probably some other positive E-words that we can't even think of at the moment, that isn't really what the Bible is requiring of us, is it? You see, Jerusalem was the holy city in the psalmist's day. It was the place where people would journey to worship the Lord. At Jerusalem, the people would come to experience communion with God and their fellow faithful. But things would soon change in Jerusalem. I'm not saying things went downhill, but, well, they went downhill. But don't take my word for it. Check out the reviews yourself. And that's where we can get to this slide now. And nowadays, in addition to trip reports that you may be familiar with, there's also websites and apps like TripAdvisor. And before I go someplace new, I always want to check out what type of reviews users of TripAdvisor leave about the place. Sometimes the reviews you read serve to build your excitement about the place you are going. And other times, they sap it instead. Sometimes you get a five-star stunner. And other times, you get a one-star dud. So we know the psalmist's excitement about Jerusalem. But what do the reviews from the rest of Scripture say about it? We want to hear from someone who's been there. And in our gospel reading today, we heard about someone who's been there, right? Jesus. So what reviews then do we hear in Scripture? Well, how about this? In Matthew 23, Jesus says, Jerusalem is a city not willing to repent that killed the prophets and stoned those who were sent to her. How about another review? The Gospels and the book of Revelation reminds us that Jerusalem was the site of the betrayal and the crucifixion and the death of Jesus. And in Matthew 24, Jesus again posts that this Jerusalem is the city where the vultures will gather and not one stone upon another will not be thrown down. Yeah. Old Old Testament Jerusalem was one thing, a place that the faithful were elated to go But New Testament Jerusalem was a different story, a place that rejected God's word and God's son too. So what does this mean for us then? Is the psalmist's Jerusalem gone forever? Well, yes and no. Today in our New Testament day, Christians aren't commanded to pilgrimage to Jerusalem to worship God like the people of Israel long ago. Of course, we know that. But we are still called to journey, to journey to worship God where he has promised that he will be. Not in a specific city that you can find on a map, but but gathered around the preaching of his word gathered around the administration and reception of his sacraments. For in the Christian church on earth, the people of God still gather to worship the Lord. They still gather to remember and receive the peace that only comes from him too. Jerusalem was known in the Old Testament as the city of peace for the faithful. In fact, that's literally what its name means. But today, the Christian church stands as the place of peace for the faithful who live in an anything but peaceful world. And isn't that why we come together here in this place? 
We come through the doors of our churches heavy with the burdens of the world on our shoulders and heavy under the weight of our own sins, too. We come together with our brothers and sisters looking for a peace that's greater than ourselves. We come together and we long to hear a word that calms our troubled conscience. We long to hear the good news of Jesus that heals our sin-sick souls. We long for something we can touch and taste and hold on to that literally brings us God's grace. And here gathered around God's word and gifts, that is exactly what we receive, isn't it? For here in this place we confess our sins and we hear anew the proclamation of forgiveness spoken to us by the pastor in the stead and by the command of God himself. We confess our sins and we receive the very body and blood of Jesus our Savior for the forgiveness of our sins and the strengthening of our faith. Here in our Lord's church we have peace, not because we're in the city of peace, but because peace is found in Christ Jesus. As it says in Romans 5, 1, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. In light of such a peace that God gives us in and through his church, we should then long to return here, to return here again almost as soon as we leave. It should be the highlight of our week the best part of our day, the one thing on our weekly schedule that we wouldn't miss for the world. That's exactly how the psalmist feels as his trip report comes to an end. But before his party leaves the gates of Jerusalem, he has one more theme to include in his report. This trip has been unforgettable. It has been a joy. Human words seem to fail to properly convey the experience. And so he leaves this holy city. The least he can do is pray for it. And starting at verse 6, he does just that. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they be secure who love you. Everything in him exhorts all who hear him to pray for the city. And shouldn't we do the same? We do, don't we? Here in church, when we regularly pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus, we pray that the church would always be a place of peace, that the faithful might be at peace with God and with each other. And also we pray that the peace of Christ would go forth from this place, go out our doors through each of us for the sake of our family and our friends and everyone else we meet out in our world and in our lives so that they might know the peace of Christ too. So the Christian church today stands in place of Jerusalem of the Old Testament. But does that mean we will never experience the psalmist's joyful picture of Jerusalem ourselves? Well, no, because the gifts and grace of God are found in the church militant now, but we also know we will experience it one day in full in the church triumphant too. You know, the Bible talks about the church triumphant, but they usually have a different name for it. And it's not a place that you can find on a map. It's not a place you can read about in a guidebook or even look up in a travel app. But all of those in Christ will be there together. And what will that holy place be called? The new Jerusalem. Revelation 21 gives us a glimpse of this holy city yet to come as it tells us there will be no temple in it. Why? For its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. God established the temple in the city of peace, 
to bring forgiveness and peace to his people. God established the Christian church on earth to proclaim forgiveness and peace to his people. But in the new Jerusalem, there will be no more need of such places or proclamations. For in the new Jerusalem, there will be no more sin, sickness, or sadness anymore. We won't need to receive peace or hear about peace. For we will be with the one who is our peace, Jesus himself. And the best news is you already know the way to get to New Jerusalem. It doesn't require getting a map or reading a review or putting any money down. In fact, none of those things will get you there. Neither will your good works or your good life or your good church attendance. But you know that, don't you? And you know the way. If not, listen to what Jesus says to Thomas in John 14. He says this, Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You see, just as Jesus is our peace here and now, so too is Jesus the way to the new Jerusalem. For in Christ and his death and resurrection for you, you have forgiveness and life and peace with God. Through your baptism into Christ, your travel plans to that holy city are reserved and confirmed. In Christ and through faith in him, you have been given the promise of life forever in the new Jerusalem to come. So thanks be to God for such a great trip that each of us in Christ Jesus have to look forward to. Thanks be to God that our time there will never end. Thanks be to God for the gift that he gives us even today of regular trips to God's holy house here and now that feed and strengthen and grant us his peace to continue to prepare us for the day when Jesus will come and take us to the new Jerusalem for all time. In Jesus' name and for his sake we pray. Amen. Having heard God's word proclaimed this morning, I invite you to stand, brothers and sisters in Christ, as we confess the faith that God has given us, and today we'll do that through the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Stir up your power, O Lord, to rescue us from the dangers of this dark world by the advent of your Son, that we may ever walk in his light and learn the way of peace. Lord, in your mercy. Gracious Lord, though we do not know the day or hour of the Son's appearing, grant that we would always be prepared by sending us faithful pastors and teachers who will boldly proclaim your word of law and gospel to us, that we may be constantly encouraged and built up in the faith. We pray for all churches with whom we walk together in this synod. 
by name. Today we pray for Emmaus Lutheran Church in St. Paul, Minnesota. Strengthen their pastor, their staff, and all their members as they go about your work in St. Paul. Lord, in your mercy. O God of Jacob, you have established your kingdom as a beacon to call all nations to yourself. Teach us to walk in the light of your peace. Lord, in your mercy. O Lord of love, visit our homes and defend us from the temptation to walk in the works of darkness, that husbands and wives may love one another and raise their children in the faith. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty Lord, you are the authority to whom all temporal authorities must bow. Give wisdom and godly insight to our president, our governor, and all who make, administer, or judge our laws. Grant peace among the nations that swords may be beaten into plowshares and spears into pruning hooks. Lord, in your mercy. Compassionate Lord, look with mercy upon the sick and suffering. Visit them during these Advent days to comfort them with your saving gospel. If it be your will, grant healing and peace to Emily, Charmaine, J.D., Tina, Billy, and the family of Marilyn Wyatt. Lord, in your mercy. O loving Father, you alone know the day and the hour when our Lord Jesus Christ will come again in glory. Keep us steadfast in the one true faith that we may be ever ready for his reappearing. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Taught by our Lord and trusting his promises, we are bold to pray our Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We are saved by Christ. Go then in his peace and with his blessing. May the Lord bless us and keep us. May the Lord make his face to shine upon us and be gracious to us. The Lord look upon us with favor and give us his peace. We end with our final hymn, Hark the Glad Sound.